famous vegetable. Yes, so we it are going, is. Thank you. So we are going to discuss where can we go wrong in managing uveitis. So you can make mistakes in diagnosis, you can make mistakes in the management, and you can make mistakes if you do not recognize the complications that are occurring sometimes as part of the management. The mistakes in diagnosis, if you look at, these are all evidence of anterior uveitis. I've just put the pictures, the keratic precipitates, the anterior lens capsule pigments, the posterior subcapsular cataract and some synecae. So uh, a simple thing that might go wrong in a busy clinic is a failure to do an adequate sit lamp examination. So sit lamp examination in a case of uveitis is absolutely mandatory for you to pick up the kind of uveitis, what kind of keratic precipitates are there, how old are the keratic precipitates, is it a granulomatous type, non-granulomatous type, are there any nodules that you can see, like you see in this picture, you can see the nodules in the Kepe nodules, uh, and about the activity, the cells and the flare. So a lot of information comes by just looking at the slit lamp examination of the patient properly without just diagnosing anterior uveitis and starting to treat. The other thing that is important here is that when you see keratic precipitates, pain and redness, and you diagnose anterior uveitis, that is wrong. Because whenever you see a patient with you suspect anterior uveitis, you have to first dilate and look at the fundus and see that you have not missed anything that is going on behind the lens. So a failure to do a dilated slit lamp biomicroscopy, again, you will miss some of the complications that are possible in the posterior segment due to anterior uveitis, which includes cystoid macular edema that you can see in this picture. Sometimes you might be having a spillover of the anterior uvi of an intermediate uveitis with a small anterior segment inflammation that you have misdiagnosed as an anterior uveitis if you do not dilate and look at the fundus. Or it may be a posterior uveitis, again, that has given a small anterior segment spillover. So never diagnose anterior uveitis unless you have done a complete examination of the eye, including the dilated fundus examination of the same eye as well as the other eye. Now, this patient is uh, one with pan uveitis with vasculitis, which again will have some anterior segment inflammation and you will misdiagnose it if you have not examined the fundus. This is again a close-up picture of the cystoid macular edema. This is cystoid macular edema on fluorescein angiogram. And another inflammatory optic neuritis is another complication of anterior uveitis that you will miss if you have not examined the posterior segment. The posterior segment examination also gives you uh, the evidence. You can find clues to the etiology if you examine the posterior segment nicely. If there is a lesion that is close to a scar, you know that it's probably toxoplasmosis. It might give you the missing link in your diagnosis, as in this case where there was a small tubercle that was sitting there that gave us the clue that it is probably of tuberculous etiology. You may get periphlebitis, patchy periphlebitis that is very classical of sarcoidosis. Now, let us look at this case. He was a 64-year-old, 65-year-old man who was treated as intermediate uveitis with a very hazy fundus view. The ophthalmologist referred it to us saying that he's not responding to steroids. But when we looked at the periphery, like Manisha ma'am showed, this is a very common mistake that is being made when the periphery was not examined properly and there is a viral retinitis. You can see the classic tongue-shaped lesions in the periphery. Very hazy view in intermediate in the will be there in acute retinal necrosis. So you have to carefully examine the periphery to look for these tongue-shaped lesions. This patient responded nicely to antiviral therapy. The other mistake that we do is a failure to do a dilated indirect ophthalmoscopy. The, the, that is what was highlighted in the earlier case. Now, this 12-year-old boy, white uveitis, early band-shaped keratopathy and complicated cataract, he presented to us. So, of course, the first diagnosis that came to our mind was juvenile idiopathic arthritis. He was put on immunosuppression and he underwent cataract surgery. After the cataract surgery, we have seen the fundus and we found this granuloma in the fundus. So in a white uveitis in children, it is not enough for you to jump to the diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's also important for us to keep in mind that other causes can produce white uveitis with band-shaped keratopathy and um, your complicated cataract. This patient had a toxocara granuloma that was causing the uveitis. And we should keep in mind in children masquerades as well. 
you can have retinoblastoma that looks like uveitis sometimes with the whitish deposits in the anterior uh, segment. You can have it as an exudative detachment in the posterior segment. You may mistake for scleritis, what is actually a ciliary body tumor with the sentinel vessels. You can mistake, again, scleri diffuse scleritis you might diagnose, but actually it, would, it was a salmon patch uh, due to lymphoma. And uh, sometimes secondary is present with exudative detachment. So whenever we diagnose cases of uveitis, it is important for us to keep in mind the possibility of masquerade as well. Now, where can we go wrong in the management? This 40-year-old lady came to us with multiple defective vision in both eyes. There were multiple sensory neural detachments with mild disc leakage. On fluorescein angiogram, there was disc leak and pinpoint leaks and the classical septate um, boule of leakage. So we diagnosed Vodko and Agi Harada and we put her on steroids. And she came back two, three weeks later with this uh, orbital cellulitis-like picture with severe inflammation in the orbit. And then she had new lesions in the fundus that looked like choroiditis lesions. And she had 3.7 millimeter choroidal thickening on B scan. And the MAN2 was necrotic with 23 into 25 millimeters. PCR for, of the aqueous turned out to be TB positive as well. So there was a element of tuberculosis in this patient, which we still don't know whether it was the steroids that reactivated the TB or was it originally TB to start with. So I think where we went wrong in that patient was failure to do routine investigations. Steroids may be your treatment, but it's always better to rule out infective pathology and TB is so ubiquitous in our population, it can coexist with everything. So the morphology itself may be misleading. Like this patient, both of them look uh, for to a novice eye, they probably look like similar cases, but one is a candida endophthalmitis and the other is a toxoplasmosis. So you cannot go with morphology alone. Like this, the falciform fold, the traction in the periphery can occur due to various uh, reasons. So morphology alone is not enough for you to make a diagnosis. Now, this patient, 50-year-old lady, pain, redness, and defective vision, she presented to us. She had exudative retinal detachment in the fundus, and that continued to progress in spite of giving her adequate steroids. And later on, with investigations, we found that she was C-Anka positive. So the exudative detachment was not, again, not BKH as we suspected. It was uh, due to the vaginas. So here, what, we, what I would like to say is failure to consult for systemic diseases. When you have made a diagnosis and it is not responding, you have to think of other diagnoses. Take the help of your physician. Take the help of your rheumatologist to investigate further for what the cause may be. This was another di diagnostic dilemma that we had. A 48-year-old female is a known case of adenocarcinoma of the lung. And she had a gradual progressive decrease in vision in the right eye. Hand movements vision she presented to us with. And uh, on the fundus, there was a large elevated lesion with disc edema, a choroidal mass. But uh, along with that, she also, this was the fluorescein angiogram. And along with the elevated mass, uh, this was her B scan, which showed a solid tumor-like lesion. Uh, unfortunately, she also had radiological evidence of TB spine at the same time and bilateral psoas abscess due to TB. So our initial clinical diagnosis was choroidal mets, but because of the evidence of TB spine, we had the confusion whether it is actually TB choroidal uh, granuloma there or is it a choroidal met. So a decision was taken to take a sample for tissue diagnosis and exciton came positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. And patient started on ATT and slowly the lesion reduced and resolved. So it was not a secondary at all. So here I want to highlight that you need to take a tissue diagnosis when you are in doubt. So in many clinical dilemmas can be uh, solved if you can take a tissue diagnosis. It may be an AC tap, it may be a vitreous tap, or it may be a vitrectomy and biopsy as the case may be. This patient, again, let us look into what can go wrong when you start managing the patient. So here, 36-year-old lady, again, diagnosis of VKH, was treated with steroids and azathioprine from elsewhere, developed fever and malaise, and then was referred to the physician, and the patient developed agranulocytosis. So you cannot give a, give a 
treatment to a patient and then not recognize the side effects. So steroid induced complications, complications due to the systemic drugs that you're giving, ATT, immunosuppression. And whenever you require long-term systemic treatment, it is always better to treat in conjunction with an internist or a rheumatologist. This patient uh, diagnosed case of VKH was on immunosuppression, regular follow-up, maintaining 6-6 vision in both eyes, came with blurring of vision, and there was a small PED-like lesion at the fovea. Now here, many times we think that it is a recurrence of the VKH, and then we put the patient back on immunosuppression. But what was happening here was a choroidal neovascular membrane that came later on after the anti-inflammatory therapy had Resolved. So late complications that are unrelated or uh, separate from recurrences also need to be recognized while you are treating the patient. And this is a patient post bevacizumab. He resolved well after three year stints. So failure to recognize sequelae or complications. So you have to be vigilant for recurrence. You have to recognize complications that can arise after some time, and you have to recognize new and unrelated disease entities also. Now, this is a surprise patient, 32-year-old female with defective vision and floaters, minimal AC cells, and a small vasculitis in the temporal periphery. We gave investigation for a vasculitis workup, but came back two days later with pain and redness of that eye, and the surprise was sitting in the anterior chamber. It was a nathostoma spinigerum, a worm-induced uveitis. So this worm was sitting in the anterior chamber and causing the uveitis. So however much you may be aware of all the causes that of, of uveitis, you can still be surprised during your uveitis practice. So finally, some do's and don'ts. Confirm when you're dealing with anterior uveitis, confirm that it is anterior uveitis alone and confirm that posterior segment complications of anterior uveitis are not there. Simple anterior, acute anterior uveitis first episode, you can do basic investigations, Manto and others have to be tailored depending on the history. Recurrent anterior uveitis will require a complete workup. Chronic anterior uveitis, if you need, especially in children, if you need more than three times steroids for more than three months, you need to put the child on systemic therapy. Uveitis in children need thorough workup. Posterior segment complications will need either suppositories or systemic therapy. They will not work with just topicals alone. Any vitreous haze, retinitis, choroiditis lesions, or vasculitis, or sensory neural detachments, it's always better to refer to a uveitis specialist. Don't start systemic steroids in inadequate dose before you do systemic investigations. It tends to complicate the issue. Don't keep patients on topicals alone if posterior segment involvement is there. Intermediate uveitis has a very chronic course, and if the vision is better than 6-12, you do not need systemic steroids. Don't start systemic treatment, especially in a unilateral case, without a trial of posterior subtenin, which is very effective. And if you see vasculitis in the periphery in a patient with intermediate uveitis, you need to think of the possibility of multiple sclerosis or sarcoid. A posterior or pan uveitis is best dealt with by a uveitis specialist. In conclusion, a thorough and meticulous history taking a complete eye examination, sensibly investigating the patient and always, like Manisha Ma'am said, rule out infective pathology, seek rheumatologist or physician's help when required, treat adequately and follow up closely. In spite of all this, in your uveitis practice, you have to be prepared to be surprised because many times our patients end up surprising us as well. Thank you all for your patient hearing. I hope I haven't overshot the time. Thank you, Manisha, for 